Um, I want to jump right into the Word of God. If you have your Bible with you or on your smartphone or you want to say Siri, open the Bible app. Uh, we're going to be reading in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11, verse 24. And then I'll be reading many scriptures after that, but I'm, this is my key scripture here. And it says, Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. Someone say, shall be yours. From the wilderness in Lebanon to the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. Tonight I want to talk about process and promise. Process and promise. Look at someone and say process and promise. You can be seated tonight. You know, this month our series has been here as in heaven. Does anyone have their prayer band on tonight? Your here's in heaven band, anybody representing in the house? Yes, that has been our focus this month. Um, and we have been talking about what it means to have heaven here, how to make this place, our life, our, our work environment, this church like heaven. What can we do to pull heaven to earth? And it's a valid question and a, and a, and a good pursuit. How can we experience heaven in our daily life? How can we experience everything that God has in the routine of our daily walk? How can we see the miraculous out of the mundane? The, this past Sunday, pra, Pastor preached an incredible message, Let It Flow. What an amazing message. Reminded us that we will never be diminished by what we give. By giving out, we will never uh, be empty ourselves. But by giving, we are actually filled. I'm so thankful for that today and tonight. And it's not just about, you know, what we can get from God, but what we can give to other people from God. I'm so thankful for that. And as we close this month out, we're finishing our 21 days of focused prayer and fasting. Hopefully your faith has been bolstered. Maybe your prayer life has been strengthened. Uh, but... How can we take what's happening in us and use it to affect what's going on around us and around the lives of other people? You know, uh, I don't know about you, but I like to look at the champions of the Bible, and, but unfortunately, I don't think I ever put myself in the same category as some of these people that we herald, even from Sunday school age. You know, we talk about people like Joseph, incredible people like Joseph, one of the most influential advisors in the land of Egypt. Joseph is handpicked by God. You know, he's been given dreams by God, and he has this incredible life. Right? Moses, the man who led a nation, parted a sea, you know, and led the people of God. Right? These incredible just giants of faith and giants of promise and giants of doing things for God. Gideon, who overcame an entire nation. Gideon overcame the entire Midianite nation with just a few men. Esther. An unlikely queen, yet the savior of an entire people. These, these, these just monumental figures. My favorite, probably David, the king, the giant slayer. Right? The young man that, that killed a giant with just a, a slingshot. Incredible people. Paul, a mighty man of God and one of the most prolific writers in the New Testament. How could we possibly put ourselves in the same category? How could we ever compare, if, if we're trying to say, I want heaven, you know, to, to come into my life, and I want to do things for God like these people in the Bible, and I want to model myself after, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I look at these people, I just it, walk away saying, there's no way I could ever measure up. How could I be like a David? How could I be like an Esther? How could I be like any of these people, like a Moses, parting a Red Sea? I can't even part a crowd trying to get through the mall. How can, I, how can I be that? How can I see heaven in my life? How can I experience the promises of God? And that's kind of what I want to talk about and just dive into as we kind of end this month and this, this idea that our theme here is in heaven, although it's our theme for this entire year because I believe that heaven is going to come into this place. And I'm going to just say this in faith that every single person, every guest that sets foot into this sanctuary will feel a heavenly pull on their heart. No matter what they come with, they're going to experience God in this place. Does anybody believe that with me tonight, that heaven is going to be here because of our efforts? Amen. But this chest tonight is going to be a representation of the promises of God. Inside this chest is everything you could ever hope for in your life, in your family, that job that you're waiting for, the dreams that you dream, the promises that you feel like God has given you, the things that you hope 
the things that you're desperate for, that you pray about, that you cry out to God about. This, this chest represents the embodiment and fulfillment of all those things. That's, that's what this is. The chest is what God can do, what God is going to do, what God has promised us. The problem is, I don't live my life there, right in front of the promises of God. I live my life over here. And we live our lives many times in this place. And uh, I don't know about you, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but, but I, know, I know promises of God. I can read God's word, I, I, can, I can dig into the word of God, and there's so many things that he's promised me, but I just feel like there's this great divide between where I am and the things that God has promised he's going to give to me, show me, do for me, or do through me. There's this great divide from where I am in my everyday life and what I feel like God has for me. And I don't know about you, but my prayer is a lot of times, God, give me those promises. I need them. I want them right now. So just take that chest and just plop it right down here in front of me. Let me open it and receive from you. I'm ready. I'm excited about it. I read in the Bible all these great things, and I want to wake up in the morning, and that's it. Or I want to say, God, transport me to wherever. You know, just tell me, draw me a map. To where that, the, 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 the promise is, and I'll walk tomorrow. I'll get up and I'll start doing, just tell me what to do. Just give me a sign. Anyone ever said that? God, just give me a sign and I promise I'll do it. Right? We, 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 want, we want a clear direction from where we are. We want to magically appear over by that chest of promises. Or we want that to appear where we are through prayer and through different things. But, you know, honestly, I don't think that's the way God works. I don't, I don't think that God works like that with you and I. And I heard one person say, God, a cosmic vending machine. You put in your prayers, you push the button, and out comes a blessing. It's not the way it works. We love it. We're a microwave generation. But and I don't see that that's the way God worked in these other stories. And I want to kind of take some time and, and just kind of dive into these different characters. So we see Joseph, as I mentioned, Joseph, this, this young man given these dreams by God, these great aspirations. You're going to be a mighty man. He was given these dreams and these, these things that God is going to do to him. But we see um, something else his brothers have in store for him. They're not as keen on the idea. So Genesis 37, 23 reads, uh, we jump into the story of Joseph. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. And if you know the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors, this coat of many colors represented favor, represented his place, represented the love of his father. So his brothers stripped him of everything, all of his potential, then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Now, this is not like they threw him down into a hole and laughed at him. They literally left him to die. They forsook him. I think that's right. Forsook him. Forsaked him. Forsaken. They hath forsaken Joseph. Mine brothers hath forsaken me. That sounds right in the King's English. So his brothers left him. So Joseph, the man given dreams by God, given promises of God, is sold into slavery. One brother says, I can't do it. I can't leave him to die. But I'll sell him into slavery. What a great compromise. So Genesis 39, you know, Joseph is sold into slavery. And then his boss, his wife, lies on him and he's thrown into jail. And then he sits in jail for a period of time until he's finally taken out because of God's hand on him. He's able to interpret a dream of the king. And then we see Joseph finally placed in this incredible position. He's like the right-hand man to Pharaoh, and he's overseeing all these things. And we see that, Joseph, and we say, yeah, that's awesome. But the reality is the path from Joseph's promise to receiving the promise, right where Joseph started and where Joseph ended, was not a pretty picture. And Joseph, this piece of rope here is going to represent kind of Joseph's life story. And we see the end of it, and we know the end of it, so it's great. But, but the key ingredient in Joseph's life in God and his promises is what? Trial. Trial is the key ingredient. Joseph life, Joseph's life, every milestone in his life is trial. Difficulty, hardship, undeserved beatings, undeserved verdicts, things that were said about him, things that were said to him, things that he had no idea that were coming, nothing he could do about it. He was doing all the right stuff, but yet trials and trials and trials. But we see Joseph receiving from God. Moses, right? 
the man who parted the Red Sea, the man who led Israel, all of these incredible things about Moses. But uh, there's another side of Moses that many of us already know, Exodus 4, verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I stutter. I've got a speech impediment. You've asked me to be a leader, but I can't even talk. So the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. If I'm Moses and I'm called by God and God has promised me that I'll lead a nation, God has given me all these promises. Again, all these things that I know that God's going to do. I'm going to say, that's great, but let's work on this uh, stutter. You're God. So let's fix this. And then after you fix that, then I can be a great public speaker. Right? I don't know about you, but if I stuttered, my first thing would be, you know what? I'm going to be a public speaker. That would be like, I'm five foot two, but I want to be a professional basketball player. I love you. Probably not going to happen. Right? So Moses, though, this man that was greatly used of God, what we realize is that Moses, his life was defined by what? Moses' life was defined by his inadequacy. Moses was inadequate. He was a terrible speaker. He murdered someone. At every turn, Moses made mistakes. God had to go get Moses off the backside of a barren mountain to say, look, please do what I've told you to do. So Moses is completely inadequate. So we see the life of Moses. We've got Joseph, whose life was identified by trial. We've got Moses here. This guy is not the, the perfect candidate, not the perfect character. So Moses' problem is inadequacy. Moses is inadequate. Joseph has trials, a great guy, but has trials. Moses is inadequate. I don't know if you found yourself in this story yet, but I believe that you will. Gideon, man, what a great guy. What, a, what an incredible leader. If you know the story of Gideon, with only 300 men, he defeated an entire army. The people that had oppressed God's people. What an incredible feat of confidence to go against everything with nothing. But we know the beginning of his journey with God was very different. Judges, chapter 6, verse 11 now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, uh, and Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. So this dude is hiding behind a wine press just to get some food. He's that scared. And, uh, you know, God speaks to him, or the, uh, the angel of the Lord appears to him and said, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. You're a mighty man of valor. And so what we see is uh, that Gideon, his response is not, yes, I am strong. In verse 13, he says, if God is with us, I'm paraphrasing, then why has all this happened? And where are his miracles, which everyone talked about? Didn't, did God bring us out of Egypt, but the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites? So what does Gideon deal with? Gideon is not a brave and strong warrior when God finds him. In fact, Gideon has severe anxiety. So anxious that he's hiding just to eat. Gideon is, has anxiety, low self-esteem. He thinks nothing of himself. And you could even probably make an argument that he's depressed. God, if really this is life, everyone said all these great things, why have you left me here? But yet God uses Gideon. So we see Gideon, not the perfect candidate, not the greatest guy ever. Gideon has anxiety problems. This is not someone that I would pick to be the leader, especially of an army of only 300. I don't want the guy that's nervous. I don't want nervous Nelly leading me into battle. I want the guy that's confident, that says, you know what, this is fine, this is enough men. That's not Gideon. Gideon was a guy that was scared, but God used him. God did incredible things through him. Esther, all the ladies, we like to talk about all these men, but Esther was an incredible, pivotal person in Scripture. Esther was an unlikely queen. No pedigree, an orphan taken in by someone else, but she shouldn't have even been considered, but she became the queen. And in Esther chapter 8, we see God's purpose fulfilled and the promise of God to save his people come through Esther. Well, Haman, an evil henchman of the king, wanted to kill all the Jews. And yet Esther had been positioned by God in the only position of influence that could overrule Haman. So what we see here is Esther comes to the king and basically says, if it pleases the king, I know this is the plan, but please spare my people. Esther was unqualified. Esther was not the right candidate. Esther was not from the right pedigree. Esther was un likely. But God chose to use her. 
Esther, unlikely, unqualified orphan from nowhere. So Esther's life, not defined by the things that we would celebrate, not defined by the things that we would maybe say are the ingredients of making a queen, yet God chose her. Why? Why would God choose these kind of people? David, again, my, my favorite guy, the teenager anointed to be king, David is given a promise from God through the man of God, Samuel, that one day he would be king, right? So I would think that, uh, you know, Samuel comes in and, you know, David, nobody even believes that David should be uh, considered, in fact, his dad, when, when Samuel comes and says, hey, Jesse, come show me all your kids. You know, God's going to anoint one of them. They don't even call David in from the field, right? They leave David out there and uh, he goes through all the kings and uh, all the sons and God says, not it, not it, not it. And Samuel goes, is, is this all your sons? And he goes, oh yeah, we got the runt out there, you know, but I guess he, we could bring him in. So David is brought in. David's anointed king, and then David's life changes miraculously. No, that's not the story. Guess what? David is anointed to be king. He's got, I don't know, I don't know what kind of oil it was or what the process was, but I'm pretty sure it was like one of those moments where it's like the angelic voices, in my mind at least. But then afterwards, what, what happens to David after he's anointed? You're going to be the next king of the whole world. He goes back out, goes back to tending the sheep. Cool. Thanks, pastor. You're going to do great things for God. Awesome. So David, the young boy, returns. And guess what? I'm going to read the scripture, the pivotal scripture in David's life. You've never heard this scripture highlighted before. Listen to this. 1 Samuel 17 and 17. Then Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an ephod and dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers are and bring back news of them. That is the pivotal moment in David's life. Cheese. Bring this cheese to your brothers. Right, and, and we, we know the story. This scripture doesn't seem important, but because David was doing what he was supposed to do, was being obedient, was submitted to his father, was submitted to what God called him to do, by bringing, saying, okay, dad, I'll do it. I'm not too great to do it. I know I'm supposed to be the future king, but I'll bring this cheese to my brothers. Because he was willing to do that, he was placed in the right place at the right time to face the giant. So because he said, yeah, dad, I'll go bring the cheese, he faces Goliath. So David, again, not anything special, you could say. He's still the kid. He's still obviously treated as the kid. He's like, I bet his dad's like, hey, king, get the cheese. Right? So David, again, we, we see him as this mighty man, but he was a kid, he was a teenager, and, and no one saw anything special in him, at, at, you know, even after he was anointed. So we see David's story was what? To me, it's one of obedience. Just saying, you know what? Yeah, I've been anointed, I've been given a promise a while back. My life hasn't miraculously changed. I don't know if anyone can identify with that. God spoke to me, the man of God anointed me, the man of God gave me a word, but my life pretty much carried on as, it, as it's supposed to go. But he was obedient, he trusted, and he waited. And then the last guy I, I spoke about was Paul. Right, and you, you may know his story, Saul, later called Paul. Um, we see his encounter with God in Acts chapter 9, Acts 9 and 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked for letters um, from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that he could found anyone who were of the way, followers of Jesus, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so he's walking, verse 3, he's journeying to Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembled and astonished and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said, arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. So we see that Paul goes, he's baptized. But what I understand about this, if Paul, Saul doesn't accept correction and a word from God, he never becomes Paul. If Saul doesn't accept that God spoke to me, God stopped me in my tracks, and I'm actually being sinful, even though I think I'm doing what's right, there's been a moment when God basically literally strikes him down blind and says, you have got to change. And Saul accepts that and says, okay, I will radically change everything about my life. Because he will take correction from God, we have Paul. If Saul never becomes Paul, so many incredible things don't happen and much of the New Testament would never be written. 
But because Saul allowed his sin to be corrected and changed, he was able to be used. God used one of the most sinful people to do one of the most amazing things. So again, to me, the defining factor, the defining piece, and even the pivotal moment about Paul was the fact that he was sinful. He was the worst of the worst. So that is his defining feature. The defining feature of Saul's life for years was the fact that he was against everything that Jesus was for. So we have all of these people. We have all of these champions of God, champions of the Bible, and this is their life. And again, I, I just represent their life and these key ingredients and pivotal things with this, these simple bandanas. But what we see are these champions that we love to look to. Their lives are littered with the very things that you struggle with. Their lives are full, chock full of all of the things that we fight of all the things that that hurt us and bind us down. But what I see is a pattern of the way God works. Because you see, I I really feel like this is a pretty accurate representation. What we see is, again, we live our life over there. We can't just get to the promises of God. But what we see are all of these things in our life. What happens is they are actually a process that God allows us to go through. And as we face circumstances and situations, what we realize is those processes, those things we may have struggled with or gone through, now are the things that actually connect us to the promises of God and the Word of God. So what we thought may have been a trial or something that we didn't want is actually the thing that tethers us to the promises of God. (laughs) Unlikely. It's not what we want to see. But these are the processes that God allows us to go through. God allows you to go through things. God pushes you through things. God lets you walk through things and puts things in your path to use you to use to get to his promises. Think about it. If Joseph doesn't remain faithful through trials, he never receives God's promise. If Moses refuses to be used through his inadequacy, The people of Israel never get out of bondage. If Esther doesn't speak up, her people perish. If Saul doesn't submit to the voice of God, he never becomes Paul. If David doesn't bring the cheese, Goliath never dies. David didn't know exactly where it was going to lead, but because he was obedient and embraced what was set before him, and he did it to the best of his ability and was submissive to the process of God up until this point, the giant falls. So what I'm saying is all of these things, inadequacy, anxiety, depression, struggles, uh, all these things that we hate and we don't want to see and we try to get out of our life, I feel like God is saying, no, I'm putting them in your life for a reason because what I'm trying to tell you is when you go through that process, you can pick up that rope and begin to pull my promises into your life. It's not random. It's not happenstance. These promises exist so that when you see what I'm going through, you can say, God, I may be anxious, but I'm going to begin to pull your promises to my life. These are the things that God has for us. Tonight, you have a process that God is putting you through right now. And guess what? You may be in this room hating every second of it, but that doesn't mean God's not using it. I'm sure Joseph was so angry, was so frustrated, was so tired. I'm sure there were times when Moses stuttered when trying to speak to someone or or relay something to Aaron, and he said, that's it, I'm done. I'm sure there were times when David said, I'm supposed to be doing something grand, but I'm just tending these sheep again and again. I'm sure Esther said, I am not supposed to be here. I am an orphan from nowhere. But God used those very things to pull his promises into their life. So don't forsake the process. You've got to go through the process to get to the promise. You've got to go through the process to get to the promise. What I'm trying to get us to understand tonight is that it's the process of God that will bring his promise into your life. Your process may be painful. It may be unexpected, but God wants to use it. Tonight, right now, people are going to be walking around this room. I want you to grab a pen. If you've got one under the seat in front of you, I want you to grab a pen. Maybe ask a neighbor if they've got a pen. 
But we've got some people that are going to go in this room and they're giving you a small piece of rope with a little label attached to it. This is what I want us to do. And we're going to come and pray here in a minute, but this is what I want us to do. I want you to think about your life. Consider your life. What is a process that God is putting you through? Maybe it's, maybe it's something you don't like, but you need to relabel it tonight. So I want you to write on this little label here something. Maybe, maybe it's something painful. This is just for you. Maybe it's something great. Maybe it's a blessing that God has brought into your life. Maybe it's a person. But guess what? For Gideon, it was anxiety. That was the very thing God targeted to give him confidence. So what we see is that in Christ, our weaknesses become our strengths. Gideon's anxiety, Gideon's depression, Moses and his inadequacy, God used it. He said, you know what, that's fine, I'm going to make you a leader. Joseph, his faithfulness through trials, Joseph's trial, being thrown in a pit and sold into slavery was the vehicle that God used, was the process that God used to bring his promises to pass. Think about it. Just for a second, I want you to write that down on this label. What is it? And maybe up until this point, you've been frustrated about it. Maybe up until this point, you haven't seen the value in it. But I'm imploring you to believe you've got to trust in the process of God if you want the promises of God. The processes that we go through are what pull the promises of God into our life. I can't transport myself to heaven. I can't automatically make God's promises come true. But he's given me a path. He's given me a process. And I've been going through that process. And you have too. But what are you going to do with it? Guess what? Many of you right now would say, God, take it away from me. I don't want it. I'm sure Joseph did. God, get me out of this prison. God, get me out of this pit. But that would be like taking scissors and cutting this rope. Because I've got to have it all. The pain, the blessing, the heartache. I need all of it. I need the entirety of this rope. If I'm ever going to see the promises of God come to pass, I've got to have everything that's going on in my life. I've got to have all the ingredients. Otherwise, I'm never going to see what God really has for me. So write on that. Once, once you've got that written, would you just stand after you've kind of written that out? Once you have something, just, just stand with me. Where we're coming to a close. After you've written that, whatever that process is on this small label, I, you know, if, if, if you would, I would encourage you to keep this because you need to remind yourself this is painful, but it's a process. And let me tell you this. If I look at these people in Scripture, I see that greater processes lead to greater promises. Think about the ultimate example, Jesus himself. He endured such pain. He endured such agony. But the promise that he brought was so worth it. So tonight, some of you, through this message, are probably have been encouraged. Thank you. Some of you are, are maybe a little frustrated, like, I don't want to embrace this. I, I, I still don't want it. But I'm telling you, God is putting you through. God is allowing you to go through. God knows exactly where you are. And he's allowing you to go through the process. And it's the process that will bring the promise. I've got to have it all if I'm going to reach what God has for me. So tonight, what you call a problem, God calls a process. You need to relabel your problem process. So when someone says, what are you struggling with? I want you just to think in your mind, yeah, it may, be, it may be hard, but it's a process. It's not just a problem. It's not just a mountain. It's a process that God is taking me through. Somebody needs to stop worrying and waiting for the promises of God. Stop doubting his hand on your life. It's, start, it's time to start using the process that God is putting you through to pull his promises to earth. Many of you are going through different things. But I just want to encourage you tonight. There's someone in this room, and I, I prayed about these stories. There's so many biblical stories, I, but, but these people really struck me. But I want to tell somebody tonight, you're going through pain. You're going through struggle. Is it worth it? You want to know, is it worth it? Can I endure it? My, my answer to you is ask Joseph. 
Ask Joseph in that jail, he didn't realize it, but the entire time he was pulling the promises of God. Yes, I may be talked bad about, but you know what? I'm one step closer to my promise. He didn't realize it till he received it, but the entire time, what felt like a trial, he was actually pulling the promises of God closer to his life. You feel unqualified? You don't even deserve to be in this room for the things you've done, or you don't, you don't belong here, you're not the person? Ask Esther. God positioned her exactly where he needed to be. He made her who she was because there needed to be a day where he said, I've got a promise for you to fulfill, Esther. I've got some people that you've got to save and only you can do it. Are you anxious? Do you struggle with anxiety? Do you struggle with depression? Look at Gideon, the weakest and meekest, the most scared guy. God said, you're the one I'm going to to conquer an entire nation so Gideon was scared but God said mighty man of valor pick up your process and begin to pull your promise into your life Gideon you may be anxious but I've got a process you've got to go through because I want to use you you feel like God has told you something in the past maybe you felt like God's hand was on your life when you were a child but you don't know what's happening you don't know where it's gone look at David we don't know the exact span of time, but there was such a long time from when David was promised something to when he actually beheld it, to he actually let that stone fly to hit Goliath. But the entire time, he was just remaining faithful and being obedient to what God was doing. He didn't realize that something as, as mundane as bringing cheese to the battlefield, but all the while, every step he took was pulling the process, was pulling the promise closer to his life. And then he found himself king of a nation. Someone needs to be thankful tonight because I'm telling you, somebody, you've been waiting on a promise, but God is saying, and you're saying, God, take me to the promise or God, bring your promise to me. But God is saying, no, I've given you the process. All you've got to do is, is don't be afraid, square your shoulders, dig your heels in and begin to pull your life. You, you've got to work for it, church. It's not going to happen by itself. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be tough, but it's going to be worth it. So somebody tonight, I hope I can galvanize you to say, you know what? I'm not giving up. I'm going to pull on my, my purpose until I see the promises of God in my life. If you want to pull the promises of God into your life, if you want it to be here as in heaven, it's going to take a process. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take blisters. It's going to take time. It's not going to be fun. You got to be consistent. You got to work at it. But I promise you, look at these people. It's worth it. It's worth it. And the very first verse we read tonight was a promise given unto Moses. He said, wherever you walk, basically, wherever you tread, that land will be yours. And we love that because we say God's going to be blessed. But, but guess what that, what that meant, what that promise meant? Moses would have to do a lot of walking. You want to claim it, Moses? Get up, put your Fitbit on, and get to walking. You want to claim, you want to claim this land, Moses? It's not just going to happen with you sitting around. You've got to get up and you've got to walk it. So tonight you've got things that you want to claim in the spirit. That's great, but you can't just do it. Uh, prayer is a part of the process. Re coming to church is a part of the process, but it's going to take all these things. The, the point is you've got to put in the work and say, God, I'm committed to it. So tomorrow I'm going to get up. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm not going to give up on my process. I'm going to continue until I see your promises. You may be frustrated, but there are promises. You may be angry, but there are promises. You may be desperate. There are promises. You may feel hopeless. There are promises. But it's going to take a process. You don't get the promises of God without the process of God. Every single one of these amazing people in Scripture show us that time and time again. So this is what I want this altar call to be. And personally, I feel like every single person, no matter what walk you are in life, no matter where you are in life, what stage of life you are in, God is putting you through a process. You are 15, God's putting you through a process. You are 50, God's not done with you. He's putting you through a process. You are 75, God still has work for you to do. He's still putting you through a process. So tonight, I want you to, I want you to clutch that, that process that you have, that little piece of, of, of twine and paper, and I want us to come together, and I want us to pray over these things, because God, I can't be satisfied with just saying, oh, I hope your promises come one day. No, the burden is on you to do the work. 
God has spoken his word. God has done his work. It's up to me and it's up to you to not look at things and say, oh, it's a problem. I can't do it. I'm scared. I'm worried. I don't know what's going to happen. Stop. Wake up and realize it's not a problem. It's a process. Can we come tonight around this front? We're not going to take too long. I'm going to let you out of here. But I believe that somebody, even if it's one person, you desperately need to connect with this. Not because it's my word, because it's God's word. So tonight we're going to pray whatever you have to do to kind of get in the solitude of your own mind and spirit. If that means you need to kneel, if that means you need to bow your head, if you want to raise your hands and receive that, I believe that somebody needs to rejoice tonight because your perspective is changing on something you were frustrated about, but you can leave tonight excited to tackle it because it's not a problem, it's a process. It's not a problem, it's a process. So I want us to pray together and then we're going to sing for a minute and I encourage you to continue to pray. But wherever you are, if you could just close your eyes and connect with God in this moment. If you want the promises of God, it's going to take the process of God. Let's pray together. Lord, tonight I believe in this room there is somebody struggling with anxiety. They are anxious about their life. They are anxious about their future. They don't know what it holds or what's going to happen. But God, I want them to realize that that is a process. God, there is somebody tonight that feels unworthy, that feels like they don't deserve it, they don't deserve a second chance, but God, that's part of the process. You want to use them. You want to go through them and do incredible things. God, somebody was given a promise and they don't see it fulfilled. They don't know where it's at. They can't find you. They don't see you, but they've got to remain faithful. And God, there's someone like, maybe like a saw that just needs to change a couple things and they know it. God, I need to make some changes. There's somebody dealing with a sickness tonight. And God, I believe you want to use even that illness for your glory. It's about his glory. Tonight, let's pray. Let's take a moment and pray because you've got to go through the process to receive the promise. Thanks for watching this video. If it has blessed you in any way, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel by clicking the button to your right. Also, if you'd like to partner with Royalwood Church to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, click the Give Now button to your right as well. Thank you so much for watching and God bless.